Imagine this. You're China. The government decides that it's time to move forward. No baby steps though, you will learn to walk by being picked up and flung across the room. The plan is to rid you of your true enemies, such as capitalists, traditional culture and sparrows. Now, the communist party's micromanaging might not go as planned. Still, your people can't complain, because every good proletariat knows to visit his local kinoplex, get a bucket of crab legs and watch model operas to see how they're expected to behave. A great fast forward later and plenty of your modern movies have maintained the level of political consciousness. And just in case some misguided soul tries interpreting the movie the wrong way, they all end with a wall of text that does the thinking for you. I've checked out a few of them. Some of them aren't so bad. And I'd like to talk about them. Let's start with the heavy hitter. The two battles at Lake Changjing movies are the ones that got me interested in the subject matter. Their movies set in the Korean War. They present the argument that the American invasion of North Korean territory was misguided, imperialistic and frankly a little cringe. Plot-wise, the protagonist is a veteran returning home to his humble fisherman family with his big brother's ashes, but the evil Americans are on the move so he gets recalled to duty. He's the company commander of the 7th Interpenetrating Company and is part of the Chinese forces tasked with crossing the border and engaging the Americans. His little gremlin brother joins the army and will accompany him. The only training he needs is ideologically charged speeches about how proud the company is about taking losses. It takes more than an hour before engaging the Americans in battle, but in the meantime we get a bunch of scenes of US air power in action, including one with incredibly bizarre editing. This is the only scene that's edited like this. Of course, they aren't going to get American actors for these movies, so what they do is get Russian ones to show off their best American accent. This whole movie is a gold mine of slightly awkward lines. You gotta barf through it out of sight. Don't embarrass the regiment. Perfect photo up for the press. Is this a part of MacArthur's next presidential campaign? You think he'll become president after this war? And what about communist China? They've deployed their soldiers and they're attacking our boys. How should we respond to this preemptive warning and their actions? Big more ammo! Never seen ammo move this fast before! What the hell is that airstrip out there? I'm building an airport because it's essential if I'm going to be responsible for all the lives here. Yeah, one it's a fatal mistake yeah, to fight a war without the will to win it. Period. I will have you scout. I will scout you with my own hands. One lump of sugar, sir. Who in the Sam hell are you? What did he mean by that? Not like we could do without them. The audience needs to know that MacArthur is an asshole. Get out Smith, here. this is war. Retreating. This is you think he knows we can hear him? That the Americans are overconfident? Don't worry, boys. This place ain't no Normandy. This is cakewalk. And that the Chinese forces have the spirit to overcome Western resources. Potato? Bean. Oh. At least the action scenes are pretty well done, they're clear, snappy and the practical effects are nice, especially the vehicle mock-ups. It does get a little too over the top at times, by the end of part 1 it's just a sea of people running into enemy fire, but it stays entertaining despite the huge runtime. Part 1 ends by showing a completely different company of Chinese forces that freezes to death while trying to cut off the American retreat. This impresses the marines so much that they stop retreating to salute their frozen foe. Fighting against men with such strong will like this, we were not ordained to win. And of course a little what have we learned section. Part 2 returns to the 7th company and mostly focuses on their attempt to destroy a pump house that's key for the American retreat. There's some stylized sequences which are interesting, at some point a random American soldier becomes a slasher movie villain. <laughs> And of course, even more fake American moments. <laughs> Have you ever played hide and seek? 
Played hide and seek, sir? Yep. I haven't done so for a long time. Certainly not at Christmas. Well, we're gonna have to do it here. <clears throat> we're gonna surprise them. Go invisible, lure them on the bridge, then jump out like jackrabbits and squash them roaches and call it a day. Well, that didn't take him long to take that bait, did it? Not exactly, sir. The explosion went off inside the pump house. Whereabouts? Inside the pump house. Oh, shit. God damn it. Did I miss something, sir? What? Was this part of your plan, sir? It was. If we win. Relay my command. Over. Fire! That was our command headquarters, you idiot! They got us! They blew up HQ! I like how he keeps track of both sides, with the US receiving reinforcements over time and the Chinese casualties forcing their plan to get more and more desperate. In the end, they kind of succeed in blowing up the place, except it doesn't matter and the protagonist dies. His little brother hugs him and seemingly dies of exposure, until this happens. So I guess in the end they lose. The filmmakers must have been more interested in showing self-sacrifice rather than victory. Might as well call this movie The Sacrifice. The Sacrifice is a 2020 movie which is also set in the Korean War. It's about a group of Chinese soldiers who need to cross a bridge that keeps getting damaged and repaired. Air attacks, artillery air attacks again, until oh no, air attacks again, again. Then the movie goes. By the way, there's an anti-aircraft cannon that's being operated by a mortally wounded man with a single leg using a stick that hits the American escort fighter in the cockpit. Man, that sounds like an interesting sequence of events that I sure would love to wit- a third of the trees. Yep, it's rewind time. Same thing, except from the perspective of an American pilot who is a drunk cowboy that quotes the Bible wrong and always flies with his cockpit open. Once again, the fake Americans steal the show. Major battleground is right there in front of us. Without the bridge, it's their hell. With it standing, it's ours. Keep your ass to. I gotta do something personal. This is my leisure time. Hell, Andrew! Get my goddamn plane back, you son of a bitch! Who do you think you are, you crazy little shit? There you are. You wanna fight, yeah? It's just you and me now. You wanna hold this bridge? You wanna hold this bridge? You gotta pay for it! It's also a more gripping perspective than the let's hope we get to cross the bridge brigade, with him going against order, stealing a plane and personally neutralizing the enemy air defense to allow a lower altitude bombing run, which is what we see at the end. Andrew feels like more of a protagonist than any single Chinese character, which I don't think was intended. Anyway, same final scene, rewind again, this time from the perspective of the anti-aircraft crews, and by this point it's pretty obvious that splitting the movie in three just wasn't the best of ideas it essentially spoils itself. By the end, the engineers and the wounded decide to become the bridge and the army gets to cross. What's the moral? Something something, sacrifice, future generation, safe nation, whatever. Aside from the experimental structure, I think it's an okay movie. It seems like they didn't have that big of a budget and they tried doing something different, which I think it's commendable. And overall, it doesn't feel as preachy as the other movie. You know what? I feel like I'm being too positive, let's change the tone a bit. So there I was, googling more Chinese war movies, hoping to find some hidden gem. I find Operation Red Sea. I was hoping to get Chinese Black Hawk down, but what I got was, um, dog shit? It parallels a real situation that happened in Yemen, except it happens in bootleg Yemen, and it's about a generic jihadist smuggling yellow kick somewhere. And he has just acquired 
the technology to make dirty bombs. Basically, it's two hours of action scenes where unflinching Superman get shot at and don't even care, leisurely shoot back, occasionally bust out a drone or gadget to further trivialize the situation, calmly throw back half a dozen enemy grenades and get trapped in a lot of bad CGI slow-mo. I can't think of a better example of a bad war movie. Oh no, a surprise helicopter is spinning my friend down and I'm stuck in this plane full of waste, radioactive waste, if only I had a weapon- oh look it's a crate of fucking stinger missiles. To be fair, it might not even belong in this video, it's barely propaganda. It doesn't even have an ending message, but it wasted my time, so I wanted to call it shit. Do it now! I can help! Sorry. Fuck! Fucking dirty! We've come full circle. Remember how I talked about model operas? Taking opera. <laughs> well, The Taking of Tiger Mountain is a modern remake of one. Taking Tiger Mountain by strategy. The intro spells it out nicely. There's a Chinese guy leaving the United States talking about his fancy American stuff. Silicon Valley, the two young ones. And as he's traveling home, he decides to watch the original movie to pass the time. What a massive traffic jam. Marry your mother, Christmas. So this movie, in its own context, is a westernized modern retelling of the same story. I'll admit, it left an awful awful first impression. Not only the action immediately devolves into bad CGI slow-mo, but also one of the characters says the most terrifying line possible in a foreign war movie. <laughs> I thought I'd never recognize anyone, but after the PLA kills most of the bandits and settles in a nearby village, the actual plot starts. There's an incredibly anime bandit leader called Lord Hawk who is terrorizing the region. He and his gang are holed up in a fortress at the very top of Tiger Mountain. Unsurprisingly, the taking of Tiger Mountain will have to be accomplished with the aid of subterfuge. The rest of the movie is about one soldier infiltrating the bandit ranks, gaining their trust, scouting the location, communicating with his comrades. Turns out it's actually a really fun movie. The action is exciting, the bandits have a lot of personality and they're all visually distinct. Them having army uniforms is actually just a setup for a scene where they test the spy's loyalty. Ooh, the PLA is attacking us, those are totally not our guys in their uniform but were such bad shots, I hope you can eat them, Mr. Not a Spy? Okay. In short, it's a pretty enjoyable movie. I would recommend it despite the bad CG. After the titular mountain is taken, it ends with the Chinese guy from the beginning coming home for the holidays and uh, meeting ghosts. Also, one extra non canon action scene, free of charge. I'll take it, that was pretty good, but if you were to watch a single movie from this video, I'd suggest this next one. First of all, this movie is set in a very unique point in history. 1937, the final stages of the Japanese conquest of Shanghai. One of the few remaining Chinese strongholds is the Sihang Warehouse, a thick concrete building sitting next to this. The International Concession, a slice of the city that's western territory, where foreigners and refugees live in relative safety from the war. Since the garrison was too close to a neutral target, the Japanese couldn't use heavy weapons and the defenders held up desperately, encouraged by the support of the neighboring civilians. The protagonists are two enlisted brothers that are mistaken for deserters at first, but will later join the defenders. This movie looks amazing, they built a whole city block as a set and absolutely everything looks convincing. Tonally it's a lot darker than the other movies I've shown, because it isn't about the PLA but the Kuomintang's National Revolutionary Army, so since these aren't communist soldiers they can be more human. My problem with the movie is that since it follows real events it ends up being a little anticlimactic. They try to compensate with speeches and some secondary characters having their moments, but eh, it's not enough in my opinion. 
Still, it's a really well-crafted movie with a few debatable choices regarding pacing. No surprise, this is the same director as The Sacrifice, and apparently this movie caused a few controversies in China. It made it all the way to the eve of its premiere before it got censored and recut, which is a shame. Man, I'm so happy to not live under the threat of constant censorship. Wait, is that a swastika? Finally, I watched My People, My Country, a collection of Chinese patriotic shorts varying in quality. They are, in order, the e. aka the deep lore behind a man who once stood kind of close to Mao. He fixed a minor fault in the automated flagpole system with only a few dozen hours to spare using the metal that people living nearby gifted him in droves. Passing by. In these movies, there have been a lot of brave men. They are nothing compared to the nameless hero of the short who has to listen to a woman talk uninterrupted for several minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I promised myself I wouldn't cry. No, but for real, she's mad at him because they haven't seen each other in three years, because he's working on the Chinese nuclear program and he's forbidden from talking to anyone for any reason. But then the people get news that the nuclear program is a success and they get separated again in the ensuing celebration. And then he dies, I think. The champion is the story of a boy who wants to give a parting gift to a girl that's going to live abroad, but the people around him want to watch a volleyball game and the antenna keeps fucking up, so he has to hold it. He races to the girl, but at the last minute decides that letting people watch volleyball is more important than love. Remember people, never do things that are important to you if that time can instead be used to solve minor inconveniences for the community. Going home is a pretty meaningless short about celebrating the Hong Kong endover and now raising the flag precisely at midnight took a little bit of practice. Hello Beijing is about a divorced dad that wins a ticket to the Olympics and wants to gift it to his son but an asshole kid steals it. Of course, it turns out that the kid actually deserved it more because his dad worked on the stadium before he died, so he gets the ticket in the end. Remember kids, always steal what you want. And to everyone else, keep in mind that all you really need is the privilege of cheering for your country during sport. The Guiding Star Looks like it is set in an apocalypse, but it's actually about two brothers just getting out of jail and being taken in by a kind old man who is a community leader of sorts. He cleans them up, gives them clothes and food, but one brother is an asshole and tries stealing money from him. The guy is not mad however, because he knows he can get them to turn their life around by witnessing missing some astronauts land and dying right after the end one for all is the short story of the best woman pilot who's put in reserve for a parade despite the fact that she really really wanted to be there so as they take off we get some flashbacks about her life and then she lands because nothing goes wrong and she's not needed but have some parade footage i guess thanks that is all the propaganda I can stomach. It all started with the Battle of Lake Changjing, which I found to be entertaining, so I went down a rabbit hole for similar movies. Mind you, I don't consider propaganda to be inherently bad, like for me the best things from Disney are their World War II propaganda cartoons. It's hard to get worked up for their patriotic movies set in peacetime, if anything the weird morals are funny in an absurdist kind of way, and when it comes to the war movies, Here's the thing, China might make black and white movies about Americans being evil, incompetent and demoralized while all their people are patriotic, abnegation prone, virtuous heroes, but last time a big budget American movies merely tried having the Chinese forces as an antagonist, the movie got gutted and re-edited to avoid hurting the box office. So what's worse, state sponsored propaganda or profit imposed censorship? Don't know, I'm just happy that I can make YouTube videos about these movies without getting cock blocked by excessive copyright laws. Thanks for watching.
music, Lieutenant! Yes, sir! <laughs> 